It is my privilege to be on the same stage with Fariboz Ranamun. I came to know Fariboz Ranamun much before I met him on account of the wonderful work he's been doing as a Hamdin, teaching himself for the last 40 years our scriptures. He's what I call an empowered Zarthushti. And I'll just briefly go over his uh, bio. He's got multiple identities. And the one I like most about him is that he's a world citizen. He's a human being first before he's anything else. So just look, uh, very briefly, born in Yazd, raised and educated in Mumbai, lived in Australia, Iran, and now in Vancouver, British Columbia. That tells you he's a world citizen. But his thinking is what's so interesting. 40 years of self-study and research gives him a unique perspective. So he's not clouded by teachers, he's taught himself. And therefore he brings a wonderful insight into what our religions are all about. I want you to take a look at the most recent issue of the Fizana Journal, the fall issue. Some of you might have it in your bags. He's written a lovely article on Gambhars. Uh, and just to share a story, he was sending out information from his beautiful website called ancientiran.com. If you haven't seen it, I'll recommend you go and look at it. And he talked about Mehrgan and to our great Surprise, we learned that it's actually supposed to be on the 23rd of September. We blasted it to our local association and it was used there in our local function. So he's a wealth of knowledge and information and I don't want to eat into his time. So I'll just finish by saying that he is now the president of the Zoroastrian Society of British Columbia who are going to host our next uh, Congress. He's also the chair of the Arbab Rustam Give Trust in Vancouver and he's the director of the World Zoroastrian Chamber of Commerce and chapter chair in Vancouver. So without further ado, we're going to have Fariboz Ranamun talk to us about the Gathas, a beacon in the 21st century. Fariboz. Thank you very much. Rujigur Nyaka. Rojgar Nikche. This is a salute that for thousands of years in Yaz we have been using, and we can use it in Gujarati to Rojgar Nikche. Um, today I'm going to speak on the Gathas, a di different perspective, and I forgot my. And hopefully, at the end of the session, we have all turned into Faridun and imprisoned and imprisoned Zahak. I hope most of you know the story of Zahak. He was a vegetarian king. He's a, it's, a, it's a myth. It's not a real king. It's a myth. And every myth has a, a moral behind it. Zahak was a vegetarian. The devil comes in disguise and makes him a non-vegetarian. So that shows that whatever the devil was changes his whole perspective on life. And then as a reward, he, the devil gets to kiss on his shoulder and two snakes come out. Those snakes have to be fed by the brain of the youth. Now, storytellers tell us, tell us that he was a tyrant, he was killing the young. No, he was not killing the young. We still have in Gujarati and in Persian, we say, Maru Mathu Beju Khai Gyo. <laughs> or in Farsi, we say, Maag Zamro Khod. So it's not eating somebody's brain, it is by talking and changing the perspective on life. So, <clears throat> a snake is of course a symbol of uh, negativity and 
the devil, so to say. Now, uh, we all who are sitting over here have been brainwashed. And everybody has been brainwashed. We get brainwashed at school, we get brainwashed through religion, we get brainwashed through everything. Election time, you see how you get brainwashed into electing somebody you may not be wanting to elect. So, I will just point out a, a couple of important things in life that we uh, have been brainwashed into believing and another point that I missed is the youth. Why would you want, why would you want the brain of the youth? Because the brain of the youth is blank, it is like a blank piece of paper. Whatever you put on it or a blank disc, hard disc, you put on it and it stays. Now if I, you want to change it, it's hard. All of us have got something in our mind and if I want to change it today, by whatever I tell you, it's not going to change. You'll like it, you'll say, oh, that's right, what he says is right, but when you go back, you're back to square one. One of the things that we believe in spite of archaeological evidence, in spite of uh, science, is Adam and Eve. We believe that man was made Adam and Eve one night, everything finished, go back to work. Science and uh, archaeology have proved against that theory. We in Zoroastrianism didn't have that. Why I say we didn't have it? Because when the Sasanians tried to collect our books and compile the Avesta, they didn't have it. So they, later on when Christianity at that time was in full force and it had started and it had been started by our enemies, the very Romans who had crucified Jesus Christ after 300 years ad adopted him. And when they adopted him, they started opposing us religion-wise. So the Sasanians looked into the books and all the papers that they had collected and didn't find Adam and Eve. So they wrote Mashiava Mashione and said, here, this is our Adam and Eve. The next one is heaven and hell. Our heaven and hell in the Gathas is not what we believe today of going there after death. No, we live in heaven and hell. Go home, kiss your wife, you're in heaven. Go and start a fight, you're in hell. Similarly for the country, for the city, for everything. But again, when the Christianity, they came up with their heaven and hell and we saw we didn't have it, oh, we lost it. And why that happened is, after Alexander, for 400 years, we had Mitraism in the country. Zoroastrianism was, had disappeared. And when the Sasanian came, we know this is history, that he started, they started collecting the books. They started collecting the books and now heaven and hell is not in that book, so what do we do? Ardhaviraf, come on. And Ardhaviraf wrote the Ardhaviraf Nameh and there is where heaven and hell has been described to us. And we believe in it. The next thing is God. If you read Herodotus, he says, that our God, the Persians did not believe in the anthropomorphic God, a human-like God, like the Romans. Our God was not human-like, but today our God is human-like. It has got attributes, it has got names, it has got all the feelings of a human being. Now, having said that, I would like to introduce you to a Zarthusht. I live in Vancouver, and in our parliament house, we have a window pane which says Zoroastra. This is in the parliament building in Victoria, British Columbia. This building was built in 1897 by a 25-year-old British architect. This young guy knew about Zarthosht and he thought it fit to have his name on the window pane. You know that in North America, state and religion are separate. You can't have them together. And that's why you won't find Jesus or Moses mentioned anywhere in the parliament building. But Zoroastra is there. 
In the 18th, 17th and 18th century, Zoroastrianism, Zarathustra became uh, popular among the Western scholars. And uh, there were two schools of thought. One was like Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche. He was the, I would say he was the person who, among all the scholars, understood Zarathustra the best. But what he did was not right. What he did was he made, put his own thoughts in the mouth of Zarathustra and put out his philosophy as Zarathustra's philosophy. But I think he understood Zarathustra best because what he says is in line, not exactly, but very close to the philosophy of Zarathustra. The other school was the religious school. And they had found a prophet. They came and saw the Parsis in Bombay. They came and saw the uh, Iranians in uh, Yazd and Kerman. And looking at them, they started studying. And they were the ones that located the Gathas for us. Why didn't we do it? Very simple. The Parsis who had landed in India without much uh, book or information because they were fleeing like today, you see the uh, Kurds fleeing, the uh, Yazidis fleeing. We had fled. We didn't have much with us. And the Riwayas tell us that because when we didn't have it, we got it from Iran. Those that were left in Iran were massacred, like you see today. Two years ago, in, uh, if you would tell that to somebody, they would say, no, Islam is a religion of peace. But today you see, and that's what happened to us. 1,400 years, not just a short period, but over 1,400 years. We were massacred. Our books were taken as tax. You either pay jazia. If you don't have, give us whatever books you have. If you don't have, I take your wife and daughter. So we lost a lot of things. And a time came when Manik Ji Limji Hataria went to Uh, sorry, it, uh, I'll come to that later on. Uh, Manik Ji Limji Hataria went to uh, I Iran and he said, I want to see my co-religionist. And they guided him, they showed him where to go. And he went there and found that they were in dire strait. They were very poor. They couldn't live freely. And so he went back to India. At that time, he made a count of how many people are in the whole country. And he came to a figure of 7,711 Zarathustras in Iran. A French ambassador has given the similar figure of 7,000. And there's another person who has also given 6,800. So we take this figure of 7,711 correct because he was a co-religionist and he was given all the information that he wanted. So this 7,711 people who are struggling to live, who have to give jazia every month, uh, where the taxman comes and takes the daughter and wife if they don't give it, will not care about finding the gathas. So Manikji came and for 20 years, over 20 years, with the help of the Parsis, paid the jazia every year to the king. At that time, it was 800 tumans, according to records in London. And later on, when the Shah died and his son came, it was 1,000 tumans. I think that would be something like 8 crore rupees or maybe more. So we had, all the, we had taken the trouble of preserving everything we had saved the books, but we didn't know the language. The Parsis had not only forgotten Avesta, they forgotten Persian. So we don't expect them to know much. So when the scholars started finding out, they found the Gathas in five parts of the Yasna. And if you look at it, the person who had compiled the Avesta had done a good job of hiding it 
for whatever reason, I don't know, they had hidden it, but it's in numerology. So 28 is 2 plus 8, 10, which is 1 plus 0, 1. 29 is 11, that is 2. 30 is 3, 31 is 3.14, 4, and so on. You come to 34, it is 7, that 43 is again 7. And that is how they had hidden it over there. We, as Arthurists, didn't know it. It was the Western scholars that found it for us. They didn't find it on this basis. They found it on how the words were and how the rhyme and rhythm was. And it was different from the rest of Avesta. So they put it aside and thought, this could be Zarathustra. And then they translated it. They have done a perfect job in translating. They have done a good job. They have found a lot of meanings. Initially, some words were wrong. Then they realized it, and so on and so forth. Yeah, this is Manik Jalim Jihataria that I talked about before. And he lived and died in Iran. He married an Iranian girl and lived and died in Iran. And he is the savior of all the Iranians that are here today. <laughs> now we come to uh, Zarathustra, who has translated the Gathas. Luckily for us, Biram has taken the trouble of getting Fezana to reprint this book, and it's available with Fezana. It is the best book you can lay your hand in in English, and his student Mubed Azar Goshas, who has done the similar work in Persian. And those two books, and if you can read both the languages and use that book, you can understand the Gathas best. But there's a limit to it. It's up to where he has given the meanings. Where he has made the free translation, you see the situation in Bombay today. If you do something wrong, you are renegade. You are in trouble. So he would have been in trouble if he had translated the way he thinks he wants to translate it. So he has stopped at giving the word by word meaning and he has put one, two, three, four on top of each of that. But when he makes a sentence, he had to put the conditions of the place he was living in. If he was, I think if, uh, if, he, if he was living in Europe, he would have done it a different way. And the proof of it is in what he has said in his preface. And you can see that. The gathas must be judged by themselves and in the light of their own contents. In other words, it would not be correct to understand a word from the gatha in the sense that it has acquired in later Zoroastrian literature. So if asha has a meaning today for you, that's not the meaning Zarathustra has. That, that is what he wants to say. He goes further and it would be, and it would, of course, be utterly wrong to read the ideas of later Zoroastrian theology into the Gathas. I'm sorry if what he's saying is, if you're a Zarathustra, good luck, but you're not following what Zarathustra is saying. Your theology is not in the Gathas. This is what Taraporwala has said. So, That's why I say that if uh, Taraporwala was not in Bombay, in India, he would have translated it differently. And I recommend this book, Enozar Goshas, for everyone to read and look at it. And the secret is, he has put one, two, three, four, five, six, 22 or 24 words, each, uh, each uh, verse has, he has put a number on it. So read that in the order that it is. When making sentence, he has moved the words around. Try and don't move it around. Keep it where it is, and it will make better sense than moving it around. Now we'll go to Zarathustra and the story of Zarathustra. We know that Zarathustra was not accepted in his own place of birth and he had to go around and find somebody 
who would listen to him. And he goes to Balkh. I don't know whether he goes from the north to Balkh or he goes from the south to Balkh, but he goes to Balkh. And Balkh today is Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and northern Iran, Khorasan in Iran. It was a huge uh, country, and the king over there was Gustas. So he goes to Gustas, and we have what he would have said and what he has said to Shah Gustas or Vistas. Of these shall I speak to those eager, the quality of wisdom that all the wise wish and call creative qualities and good creation of the mind, the all-powerful truth, which is in Asha. Truth, the, the, whether this is true or false, is in Asha. And Asha is, for us, at the our stage, is nature. Asha is the universe. And truth is only in nature. It's not what I'm telling you is true. We can argue about whether what we are, tell, what we are telling is true, but no. If it is harmony in, with nature, that is the truth. And the aim of all this is what? Truly, and that more and better ways are discovered towards perfection. So, Zaratush goes and tells Gustas that I'm going to teach you how to use your wisdom, and the end result is that we have to go towards perfection. You cannot be perfect. We have seen for centuries we have been Improving, improving, improving. We are not perfect yet, but we are going towards perfection, and we'll be going always towards perfection, bettering ourselves if we go do the right thing. So, now why did he go to uh, Gustas? Why didn't he go and stand on the mount, or go to the cave and find out uh, things and come and tell the people? The reason was that he was talking about wisdom, and what he wanted is that the wise people, it has to start from the top. And we'll come to that why it has to start from the top later on. So he had to go to the king because the laws had to be good, the rules had to be good, the guidance had to be good. And that's why he went to the king. And the king had two very important learned people in his court and they listened to Zarthosh. He didn't have to go and cure the horse of Gustas. <clears throat> for him to accept him. He had to convince Jamas and Farashastra to be able to convince Gustas. And we see this verse in the Gata which says, the progress through knowledge, the seeking of supreme Ahuraic harmony was the desire of worthy, worthy Frasha Ustra. And by the way, Havovi is the sister of Frasha Ostra and Zartush marries his sister later on. And he liked this for his people and other people and to show the way to all of the limitless good use of the mind. So this learned man likes what Zartush says and he says, I want this for my people and all the people. They should all know this. This is very good. Everyone should know it and everyone should follow it. I love it. He recommends it. Jamas recommends it uh, to Vishtas too. <coughs> and this is the decree, the story of the decree that Vishtas issues for his country. Given the knowledge that results in goodness, gained through the mind, truly gives righteousness, which thus desired for his people and decreed that truly wisdom shall rule and that those words shall, should be carried out by all grades. There's no difference. Everyone, farmer, warrior, engineer, doctor, whatever you are, everyone has to follow the same rule. It is wisdom. Use your wisdom. Masdiyasna. And Mazdiyasna became the law of the day in Gustav's country. Now, Zartosh 
had done his job. He got the king on his side. Now he had to practice what he preached. So he goes to the beautiful lakeside of Lake Hamun, which is today on the border of Iran and Afghanistan. It is dry today, very few salty water is there, but at that time, most probably it was like the Caspian Sea that we have in Iran today, or a beautiful lake, and he goes and settles down there, and there he starts his research. When he starts his research, he had, and he uh, is said he had an observatory like Jantar Mantar that we have in New Delhi. They call Jantar Mantar, it's a small observatory. He had that. And over there he realizes that he's found something very important. He realizes that when the sun is at 63 degrees longitude, which is on the border of modern day Iran and Afghanistan, there is sunshine from Japan and Australia to Africa and Europe. The whole area has sunshine. So he calls the 63 degrees longitude as Neem Ruz, midday. When the sun is in the midday position on 63 degrees longitude, this is what you get, sunshine from here to here. Not Greenwich. Greenwich is a political meridian. This is the only scientific meridian and the only scientific meridian that you can find ever. So Zarathosh was using his wisdom. He was practicing what is preaching. And you'll be surprised that the Taliban did not know about it. Otherwise, the name would have changed. In Afghanistan, you have a province over here, which is called Nimruz. And this province is on 63 degrees longitude. To this day, this is the modern map of Afghanistan, and you have a province over here which says Nimruz. Next, Zarathustra realizes that, yes, we have New Year at equinox. An equinox is when the sun is going from north to south. East to west is what we see, but north to south also it goes, right? So when it goes and cross, the moment it crosses the equator, it becomes equinox. The day and night is equal. And it happens at the, in a second. It just, the speed that the earth is moving and the sun is moving, it just crosses it. And that's our new year. And that's why you see we have new year every year at different times. He realizes that in that particular year, and the year is 1725, and I've got to that figure by going to the NASA website and uh, getting the sunrise and the equinox times by putting in a, uh, the date you can get those figures. And I've got it, and I've realized that in the kingdom of Baal, in 1725, that could have happened. Very lately, I was in Dallas, and Anaita Sidwa, who is teaching astrology uh, in uh, schools over there, she had a program that we checked on it, and we came to the same conclusion that in 1725, in the kingdom of Baal, the sun rose exactly at the time of the equinox. So, Zarthosht named it no rules. That particular year was no rules. That one new year was no rules. And why was that one year no rules? Because the sunrise and the equinox happened at the same time in Balch. And this was 3,300 years before Galileo was punished for telling that the earth is not the center of the universe. We see that we follow the sun around and celebrate it. On the equinox, 
we celebrate Nowruz. On the first solicit, in, we celebrate Tirgan. In the next equinox, the autumn equinox, we celebrate Merigan. And in the solicit in December, on December 21st, we celebrate Yalda or Daigon. Yalda is a, not a uh, Persian or Avestic name, it's a uh, Cyrillic language, so we can call it Daigon because that's also uh, the festival of Daigon is also closed there. After that, we have archaeological evidence that in 487 BC, in Takhti Jamshid, the same thing happened. And we have all the archaeological evidence. And the Greek have said that the Darius, when the equinox happened, there was a square stone that the sun, uh, rays of the first sun in the morning, at the time of the equinox, lighted that stone. And today, people are confused what this Kabe Zartosht is. And this is where the sun shined the first rays of the sun when the astronomers announced equinox lighted this stone. And it was no ruse in Takhti Jamshin. It is important to note that from every kingdom that came, that were under the Daras, came in numbers seven. There are seven people from each Babylonian, Lydian, and every other uh, country that were under their control. They came in seven numbers. Now, 215, the equinox and uh, sunrise will coincide over here. Sorry. Over here. It will be Malaysia and China. No ruse will be here. In 216, no ruse will be on this line. When the equinox happens, the sun will rise over here. So I have looked up, and Sofia in Bulgaria is one of the countries, uh, one of the cities where you can go and see this. And Rointen Rivetna, if he's here, celebrated this some years ago when it happened in Chicago. He tried his best. Unfortunately, there were only six people that accompanied him on that occasion, and that picture which he took is on Fezana uh, cover. Now we go to the translation, we go back now that we know what Zarathustra is and what his mindset was, we go back to the translation of the Gathas. I just have, taking that book into consideration and all the meanings that he has given, I just have this input to add to that book and everything changes. The key words that make a difference in the translation of the Gathas are Mazda, it is mentioned 164 times in the Gathas. Ahura is mentioned 131 times. Mazda Ahura 50 times, and God Ahura Mazda only eight times. But what have translators done? Oh, Zarathustra prophet, he must be talking about God all the time, right? So they converted all that four into God. So in 241 stanzas, you have 353 times God. It becomes a book of God, oversold God. 1.4 God in every stanza. Now you want to put that God into a sentence, it's like in a school. You give them a word and tell them to form sentence, every student for a different sentence, and that's what we have. Every translator has a different translation. What does each word by itself mean? Mazda is wisdom, Ahura is creator or creation, Mazda Ahura is wisdom in creation, and Ahura Mazda is the creator of wisdom or God. If you give this meaning to those words, don't call all of them God except Ahura Mazda, which is God. And come on, if you are going to tell a people who have hundreds and thousands of God that there's only one God and you give them four names, you're going to confuse them. So he's not going to do that. Translators talk about rhyme and rhythm. It's not true. You're not talking about a man who goes to the cave and comes back with answers. You're talking to a man who can say Nimrus and Norus, who has the knowledge, who has the wisdom. So now this is what happens. 
This is his first prayer and the first verse in the Gathas. You don't go to the Dharma man and say, Tata ne apio, mani ne apio, Godrej ne apio, mani ne apio. This is what he say. I seek with reverence, with uplifted hands, the perfectness of the mind wisdom. So Mazda here is wisdom. So you're asking God to give you wisdom. The first good rule in Asha is, all should aspire to make good use of the wisdom in the mind to create harmony between the universe and the inner self. So, you ask for wisdom and just don't keep it over there. The first good rule is that you have to use that wisdom and you have to use the wisdom to create harmony with nature, with the universe and your inner self. Then he says, certainly I shall acquire the wisdom in creation. There's a wisdom in creation. And today we know that. We have been to Mars, we have been to Moon, we have been to Saturn, we are going everywhere. And how do we go there? Because we know the formula. Some items are not there, remove them from the formula and you can calculate it. And that's why we can land on the comet. So, certainly I shall acquire the wisdom in creation through good use of the mind. I shall master the dual forces, physical and mental, through knowledge, whereby desiring and achieving enlightenment. Truly the Asha, derived by the good mind, never before known, among the wise and all creation, with it make good rules, never waning, increasing righteousness, leading us towards perfection. It's all about going towards perfection. And if you, get some, if you know something, you have to not patent it and keep it in your closet and try to make money. No, you have to go out and use it. Use it for the good of mankind to create perfection, to go ahead. And what is, the, what is it that you want from him? You want to become a millionaire? No, he doesn't say that. The satisfaction that you get, the satisfaction that the wise man who finds something, who discovers something gets is this. And those who are righteous are so because of the good deeds and the use of the wisdom of the mind in righteous way, in harmony with the wisdom in existence. Mazda Aura. Wisdom in existence. Their aim achieved as designed. And those assuredly are pleased whose results are known to be righteous faithful and praiseworthy. If the result of your work is righteousness and everybody is living happy because you have discovered something, that is your reward. Not that you become the next Bill Gates. Now, what the students of Zarathush did is they put all this into what we call wrongly the seven immortals or the angels. It was not angels. It is simple rules and simple but very effective and that comes from the verses that I read to you. Vahumana or Bahman, good mind. Use your good mind to acquire and learn Ashavaishta, the ultimate truth, the laws of nature. And when you learn the laws of nature, what do you do? You use them to make good rules, good laws, good products. What will happen then? It will lead you to lawful desire righteousness, where the laws are good, where the products are good, where everything is going according to nature, there's no pollution, there's no global warming, everything is going fine, that society becomes a righteous society. And what happens in a righteous society? In a righteous society, people who live in that society move towards perfection. It will pave the way towards perfection, mental, physical and spiritual and it will lead to immortality. Immortality doesn't mean that you will not die. You will die, but your name will remain for generations and generations and generations, depending on what you have done. If you have done something good for your family, your children and your grandchildren and your gra their grandchildren will remember you. If you have done it for a country, the country, and if you have done it for the world, the world, you will be immortal. There's another aspect to immortality. And that is when you're living. When you're living, at that time, you will lose the fear of death. 
You will not be afraid of death. Death doesn't mean anything to you. And at that stage in life, you are at a stage where you come to yourself. And it is called Khud A. Or in Persian we say Khud A. Come to yourself and you realize Ahura Mazda within you. Not the Ahura Mazda of the Romans, which is sitting up on the mountain, sitting up in the sky, looking at you, writing what you're doing, going to punish you later, sending you to heaven and hell. No, the God is within you, and you will see that God within you, and that's why we say Khuda. Khud A or Khud A. And that's where Ahura Mazda comes into the picture. Now, this is an important verse. What do you do with all the information that you have got? You have got very good uh, wisdom. You have got all the information. It's the best thing that you can do. You can make the uh, world a righteous uh, world and all that. You keep it to yourself? No. It's the asha when you gain with mind's good use, having realized wisdom, the path to righteousness, the ultimate message of wisdom through words excellent, we shall turn those who do not know by speaking. So if you know something good, give it out. And this is our good thoughts, good word, good deeds. You go to any translation, you won't find it because of the creation that comes in over there. Every religion wants to know how the world was created. So Zarathustra must also ask God, how is, did you create all that? And that is why they have turned this around and asked, oh, how much that tell me how creation comes into being? But no, let the words be where it is. Clean your mind of all the theology that you have and put the words that Tara Purwala has put in its place. Don't move it around and this is what you'll get. Everything that is created was first a thought. So everything that you see around it has been created by us and it was first a thought. Somebody thought of how to make something and they made it. So he says, let your thoughts be good. And what are good thoughts? Not what I tell you or you tell me. Good thoughts are those that are in harmony with the wisdom in creation, in nature, at our level. If you are in harmony with wisdom, nature, that is a good thought. And what do you do with that? Let your good thoughts be known through good words. Bad thoughts, don't tell anyone. It will go away. Good thoughts also, if you don't tell anyone, it will go away. But if you get up in the morning, you had a thought at night, tell your wife, tell your children, it will happen. You won't go to the next Congress, in Vancouver in 2017, talk about it, you will come. Don't talk about it, you will not come. Let your good thoughts be known through good words, for that's when creation first comes into being. The moment you talk about that thing, about that idea, about the thought, that's when the creation first comes into being. That's the first step in the creation of whatever you are thinking about. And I end by taking you back to what Tara Porwala has said. And I believe in what he has said. And that is why I've given you a different translation of everything. And I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present these things to you. And if you have questions, I'm there. On behalf of the organizing committee, uh, I want to give you a present uh, in acknowledgement of the work that you have done for us.